Welcome to Business Leaders Coach Podcast, where we educate, enable, equip, and empower you to be the best leader that you can be. My name is Toyo Shambi, founder of Business Leaders Coach, and today I want to share with you five great leadership books I read in 2021. Yes, five great leadership books that I read in 2021. I'm going to give you a snapshot from each book. Uh, Many people that know me know my passion for reading nonfiction, business, personal development books. I'm either listening to an audio book and I'll consider that as reading or reading. Maybe I'll read roughly two books a week. So it wasn't easy for me to make this decision to select five. Uh, I might need to do another episode because I specifically had to narrow it down to leadership books and I might choose a different category maybe later on. You can definitely let me know your thoughts. Uh, Today, we're going to be looking at five books that I have selected. I'm calling them great leadership books. So if you are a business leader, I would strongly recommend that you actually even buy the books. You see the links in the show notes to get them, read them, apply them. Now, if you can't, then definitely listen to this all the way through because what I am going to do is share one main thought from each book that can help to shift your mindset. And then I'll give you at least one action or practice, something that you can implement from each book. So I'll try and guide you so that if you don't get the chance to read this book, at least you have a good overview of the book and more important, something to apply. And that's what I want these podcasts to be about, something that you don't just listen to, but something that you can actually take away and apply even today. So let's go. Book number one, Humility, the New Smart, Rethinking Human Excellence in the Smart Machine Age. And this is a book by Edward Hess. Now, Edward Hess has written quite a number of books. One of them is Learn or Die. Uh, His recent book actually that came out last year was actually Hyper Learning. And so this book, Humility, The New Smart, was written a number of years ago. It's not one that was written last year, but it's one that I did read last year. And I do recommend all his books. But I believe that reading this one that I'm recommending, Humility, the New Smart, gives context to all his other books, especially Hyper Learning. And so reading this will give a lot more context to the other books that you would read. And so I start with this book because he shares some fundamental things that I think are so important for you as a leader to understand. And I think it's the perhaps the most important secret for surviving and thriving in this new economy economy. Uh, It's a complete mindset shift that many of us need to really not just be aware of, but be ready to accept. Uh, He calls it the smart machine age, so SMA. And one of the quotes from the book, he says, technology is even beginning to replace knowledge workers, people who have believed that their professions were immune to automation including accountants, business managers, doctors, lawyers, journalists, researchers, architects, education, teachers, and consultants, smart technologies will become ubiquitous, invading and changing many aspects of our professional and personal lives, and in many ways, challenging our fundamental beliefs about success, opportunity, and the American dream. Obviously, he's based in America. I think this is actually a global thing. And so I want to just give you a snapshot of this book because his definition is that we need to have a new understanding of being smart. And so he calls it new smart. Now, his definition of new smart is to be is to excel at the highest level of thinking, learning and emotionally engaging with others that one is capable of doing. So that's what it comes. What is what he means when it when he's co- talking about us becoming new smart. It's about emotionally, intelligently engaging with people, understanding that the emphasis on the technological side is going to happen anyway. It's going to be our relational experiences with other people 
that's going to make us be more smart. You get it? Now, his definition of humility is important as well. And I'm going to just quote from the book. He says, what do we mean by humility? We do not mean its common connotations in US culture and I would say UK culture as well, being meek or being subdued or thinking that we're not a worthy person. He says our definition of humility, which he refers to throughout the book, is a mindset about oneself that is open-minded, self-accurate and not all about me. And that enables one to embrace the world as it is in the pursuit of human excellence. I think just by giving those definitions in itself is important. It's something that I would also say is part of what I call the learner mindset, being open to new ideas, being not afraid to be corrected by other people putting yourself in situations where you are learning from whoever it is in the room, whether they're young or old. And I think that's the fundamental uh, perspective that leaders have to take now in this new economy. So what can we do? What can we do to become more of this humble and new smart mindset? Well, Ed advocates that we have to change the behaviors that inhibit our abilities to excel at smart machine skills, right? So we have, to, we have to change our behaviors around that. He believes that there are four fundamental behaviors that will help us overcome our nature and nurture limitations. Number one is quieting our ego. Number two is managing self. And what he means by that is managing our thinking and our emotions. Number three is reflective listening. And number four is what he calls otherness. And that means emotionally connecting and relating to others. Now, the book goes through how to develop this in chapter eight You know, of the book. You have your new smart behaviors assessment tool to find out where you are in those four areas. So if there was any action and you picked up that book, go straight to chapter eight and you can assess yourself in those four areas. And if you had a leadership team, you, you might it might be great for you or for all of you to read the book, do the assessment, and that way you'll all be on this new smart journey together. So that's my first book, uh, Humility, The New Smart. Definitely take that on board. I think even if you don't read the book, just <laughs> the character quality of being humble will be the main takeaway. My second book is uh, one that I've mentioned in, in another previous podcast. And the second book is Leading with Character by Jim Lur. And Jim Lur is, <laughs> to me, he's a hero in many ways. He, I think he has nailed down what we should be focusing on as leaders, you know, Jim became well known in the corporate world with the book Power of Engagement. And this book was designed to help to begin to practice on character growth. So it is actually a book that comes with a journal with some exercises that you can do 10 minutes a day. So the one thought that I want to focus on is the simple question that he puts in chapter four. You know, Jim asks, who are we becoming in the chase to the top? His point is that, you know, mankind has been on earth and we are always chasing after something. But then he asks us to stop and ask ourselves these three questions, right? And the questions are, if we were to simply stop and ask, what am I chasing? Why am I chasing it? And who am I becoming as a consequence of the chase? And it's one of those questions that sometimes when you ask people, they will end up saying they're chasing after money, profit, growth, whatever it is. But then when you ask yourself, why are you chasing it? I think 
it really can stop us to find out what is it, you know, when is enough enough? And who am I becoming as a consequence of the chase? Now, if those three questions doesn't give you clarity, if you are a leader of other people, then you could also ask this additional question to understand the impact that you are having. And that question is, who are those that I lead becoming? Who are they becoming? This is definitely a thought provoking book. I have personally gained a lot of clarity around what I want to achieve and how I can really help others. You know, based on this book has really helped to define my coaching because it really helps us to focus on things that matter most. One of the activities in terms of the actions, one of the other uh, activities in the book is to make a list of six words that, dis that best describe how you most want to be remembered after your death. Yes, it sounds a bit morbid, but hey, you know, it's one of those things that we, we, these are the kind of activities sometimes that we do need to do to force us to think about what really matters. And so you write down six words that best describes how you want to be remembered after your death. Death. In fact, you might want to pause this if you can and do it even right now because the next thing I'm about to say then won't be too much of a surprise or even if you're just thinking your mind right now, what comes to you, you know, six words, what will come to you that you'd be able to write down in terms of what this, what, how would they, what, how would you want to be this talked about after you've gone? That's something that we can all do. And uh, just giving you some time to think about that. Now, typically, we end up writing character qualities, such as he was generous, she was kind, she was integrous, she was loving, he was humble, he was caring. That's what we most all of us, and he even says in the book that whenever he does this in the workshops, typically the same thing comes up. So his point is that most of the time we are actually chasing the same thing. His point is that even though we might not know it, we are chasing or we should be chasing after our best moral self. So what are you chasing? Is it money? Is it success? Is it more security? This book is going to show you that we should be working towards becoming the best version of ourselves. And that's the reason why when I start the podcast, I talk about helping you become the best leader that you can be or the best version of yourself. That's what I want to support all those around me. That's what I want to be. I hope that we are on this journey together. The book has 50 different character qualities that you can assess yourself on and comes with a journal that you can use 10 minutes a day to build your character. In fact, I did a podcast using mentioning this book, How to Grow Your Character and Competency, which was episode 29. And I'll put a link to that in the show notes. A fantastic job that Jim does also to just help us understand that not all characters are the same. You have uh, what's called performance character qualities and you have moral character qualities. So select a character quality that you want to strengthen and then assess yourself on a weekly basis. And so using the book gives you that description of those character qualities and you'll find that really helpful. So my next book is book number three, uh, which is from my good friend, Obi Abuchi. And Obi was on the podcast in episode 28, How to Lead from Your Core, uh, A Path to Becoming a Purposeful, Courageous and Resilient Leader. Obi is a good friend of mine. We practically speak almost every week. So I am happy to recommend his book, not just because I know him, but he's definitely given us some things to really think about. And the one thought that I think is to mention in this book is he asks us, what game are you choosing to play right from the beginning? Uh, are you playing the ego game or the service game? And the ego game, he goes through five levels. Number one, playing to lose. Number two, playing to cruise. 
Number three, playing to improve. Number four, playing to compete. Or number five, playing to win. Now, his point is that it is all an outward show. Uh, so let me just quote um, Obi. He says, sadly, building our life and leadership legacy on the qualities that define the ego game only serves to create an unstable foundation in the way we live and lead. So much so that when the pressure of life and business come our way, they rock us to our very core. What's more, leaders who play the ego game at best achieve compliance in their people, but they never ever win hearts and minds. Very important aspect about engaging people with your authentic self. And so he suggests that the alternative is the service game and is all about playing to give, grow, build, contribute, and serve. Obi suggests that we work on building our core. Now, core is actually an acronym, meaning C for clear values, O for optimistic worldview, R is for rewarding habits, and E is for empowering beliefs. So if you want to get into the action part of the book, chapters 7 to 10, give great ways to apply the core acronym. And so my one thought is that you can, I would suggest even today, actually applying the rewarding habit of reflection, something that we can all do, something that perhaps leaders don't do enough which is to actually simply ask yourself at the end of today or first thing tomorrow morning, simply just ask yourself, just the, it's the reward of reflecting, right? Creating rewarding habits is his point. And I'm going to ask this question, you know, what did, ask yourself, what did I do well in the past 24 hours? And see what you come up with. Because a lot of times we're so busy that we are not even aware of the things that have gone well. Our brains are more geared towards finding out about the things that didn't go well. So put that into practice from uh, leading from your core. And I hope you would find that beneficial. But a brilliant book that I definitely recommend you go through that as well. Book number four is From Startup to Grown Up. Grow Your Leadership to Grow Your Business by Alisa Khan. She's known as the startup coach. You know, after reading this book, I did message her and we had a brief interaction, hoping to get her onto the podcast soon. And so I would suggest that this is one of those books that if you are a CEO in the process of scaling up your business, reading this book will help because it can serve as a good resource as you transition or as you make this leadership journey. I love the book, it's very, very straightforward, very clear. Uh, the main points to the book are, the parts of the book are managing you, managing them, and then managing the company. A lot of her stories validate what I see myself as a, as a leadership and business coach, uh, that no matter who you are or how big you might want to grow your company, it is always going to start with you. And so that first part of the book, she gives a lot of clarity around the role of a CEO, things you need to be on top of regarding your own personal well-being. And this is something that one cannot overemphasize that no matter how big your company might scale, you still have to deal with you. And then the other part that I'm just going to quote, I'm going to quote actually a part from the book because it's something that I see sort of happen quite a lot is the debate between should the leader also be a manager? And here's what she says. She says, people love to talk about the difference between managing and leading. Entire books have been written on this and I've been at more than one meeting where people debate the distinctions as if it were a religious tenant. Spoiler alert, in these debates, leaders are always seen not so subtly as better. People say, as if bragging, I'm a great leader, but I'm a terrible manager. 
I do love a good leadership story, but I think it's important to recognize that the day in, day out grind of management is what actually gets things done. And her point being that you can't just delegate things the moment you start to hire staff or you can't just call experts in to help you sort these people out. You're going to need to lean in and have those challenging conversations. However, this book does also give you some scripts, for instance, of around how to have those conversations, how to deal with certain problems that you're most likely going to face as the business begins to scale, which is what I see as well when I coach these type of uh, leaders, which is that people love the flexibility and then all of a sudden things are becoming a bit more organized or more what they will consider to be corporate, but actually is putting principles or systems and processes in place and people don't like that. And you as a CEO need to know how to navigate those transitions. And this is definitely a great book that will give you many of those practical ways of how to do that. The main action point that I'm going to take from this book is praise is your secret superpower. And what she says is that CEOs forget that acknowledging your people goes a long way when you do it genuinely. And so my suggestion to would be even today, find somebody to acknowledge when it's done genuinely and around something specific, it goes a long way. So action for you, find someone to acknowledge, thank and praise in your business today. Find that person and do it. Okay. Book number five, the heart of business leadership principles for the next era of capitalism by Hubert Jolie, who was the former CEO of Best Buy. Now I think this book is one that every CEO must read, especially if you've been a CEO of a business that has been more like well-established. However, at the same time, if you are just starting your business or scaling your business, you would find so many great nuggets from this book that will help you build the right way. Angela Arendt, former CEO of Burberry, now senior VP Apple Retail, mentioned that it would be the defining book for this decade. Jeff Bezos predicts that this will be taught in business schools around the world. I can understand why they would say this. It's because this book is the story of an old school minded CEO's transformation into the new smarts. And I can say that this book pulls the other four books that I've mentioned and gives them almost like gives them life. You know, it's like all the principles that I've just mentioned being brought to life in this book. There are many things I can share. Chapter three, the problem with perfection is where we can all find hope that we too can change no matter how long it might take. In that chapter, Hubert shares about his struggle with feedback. And that's definitely one that I would recommend people understand and read to see how he had to transition. But there is a chapter that gives really clear examples of a question I get asked a lot, which is, Toye, how do I connect people to the company's vision? In fact, two weeks ago, somebody asked me the same question. And in chapter nine is the place, that's the place to go where he gives a practical story and example of how it's done. He shares about a manager, Jason Luciano, that has a clear process that engages all his staff. And it's quite simple. He mentions how this manager simply asks his staff, his team, what is your dream? And then his answer is, well, let's work together to help you achieve it. And what Hubert found out was that his real genius was then to find a way to link their dreams with a company purpose. And this is so interesting because two years ago, I ran a workshop for a company I was working with and did exactly that. It was a short workshop and it was simply tying people's passion with the company's 
purpose. And what he found, Hubert, was that the managers that were able to help their teams achieve their dreams were extraordinary and they were what he calls incredible to witness. And here was his finding. This is in, in the book. He says, humanity is what binds personal to collective purpose. Most people want to do something good for others. And when a company strives to do good things and help people, the connection between personal drive and the company's noble purpose is easy to make. Hence, it is important that your company has a clear purpose, right? That's what I'm saying now. So this is the reason why you hear me talk a lot about having a vision, having a clear purpose. So the question is, does your company have a clear purpose that everyone knows? It's, one, it's not the kind of purpose that's just on your website, but nobody talks about. And is it clear? Does it have some kind of benefit to the end user, which should be the customer? Throughout the book, Hubert mentions the purpose of the company time and time again, which is Best Buy, which is to enrich lives of customers through technology. And you could easily see how everything they did was linked to that. So the action, how does this work? He himself writes in the book, right? And this is what he says, how do we foster the connection and nurture it? He mentions a few things. So I'm going to mention them of what they did and what they are doing. Number one, explicitly articulating the people first philosophy, something that he talks about in the book where he talks about people before profits. And he has a big chapter on that, really valuing people and the staff members first, not necessarily just the customers, but the staff members. Second, exploring what drives people around you those that are around you, what drives them, exploring that. Number three, capturing moments that matter. And then number four, sharing stories and encouraging role modeling. Uh, number five, framing the company's purpose in a meaningful, human and authentic fashion. And that's, you find that in the book, you find out how he's able to articulate. I mean, they're just selling technology. They're selling laptops and, and things. However, they're able to articulate it in a way that's meaningful. And then number six, spreading meaning. So that's that book. And I would definitely <laughs> recommend that you get that book. Uh, it's a fantastic, I think it's definitely a book that is to some extent slightly ahead of its time where a lot of people are not there yet, but I can guarantee that he is the first among many that are going to be promoting this idea in the either it's some of these smaller companies now, maybe you that I'm speaking to, these are the businesses that you are going to create uh, or and some of the others will be changing in this direction as well. Okay, so there you have it. Five great leadership books I read in 2021. Number one, Humility is the New Smart by Edward Hess. Number two, Lead with Character by Jim Ler. Number three, Leading from Your Core by Obi Abuchi. Number four, From Startup to Grown Up by Elisa Kohn. And number five, The Heart of Business by Hubert Jolly. Links to these books will be in the show notes. You can go to businessleaderscoach.com and search for or click on podcast and then look for five great leadership books read in 2021. By the time you listen to this, you can also subscribe to get access to the business toolkit that you're going to see there or just subscribe to the downloadable PDF and that will give you access so that you can be informed when I release the next episodes. Subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to your podcast. Follow us on LinkedIn. Instagram or Facebook and why not share this with your team and maybe choose one of the books to read together. That might be a good way of creating harmony and a, a great understanding of what you are learning and you're sharing it with your team. For now, this is Toyo Shinbi for Business Leaders Coach signing off and I look forward to speaking to you shortly.